Good morning. I was going to do a bit about the Northern Lights, but uh, yeah, Danny's done that now. So, uh, Aurora bore off. Aurora bore off. <laughs> now, I missed it, so I'm really bitter about it. Uh, I was livid looking at Facebook. Because I, like, I was awake. I was awake. I was writing this. I was preparing for this morning. I just didn't look out the window. Anyway, uh, this morning uh, we'll do some, uh, something a little bit similar to where we talked about curiosity. Uh, it was a little while ago. Um, but it might not be as fun. I'm sorry for that. Um, but I think it's important to look at what we're doing here as Q. Um, this time we'll focus our curiosity on a specific question. And a question that on the surface sounds a bit daft. The question is, what is church? So, straight off the bat, we're going to get straight into it, right? So, on your tables, you've got post-it notes and pens. Some of them are new packets, by the way, so you might want to spend some time just opening it into those because they take a while and it's painful. <laughs> um, and so, what we're going to do is uh, write some words. You can uh, draw some pictures, discuss on your table, um, feel free to discuss anything, and uh, blah, 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 blah. So I want you to, uh, the question is, what comes to mind when you hear the word church? Now, I'm going to bring this board down here. So if you want to scribble stuff down, you can draw pictures, single words, random things, anything that comes to mind. Um, come and stick them on the board, and we'll have a look at them in 10 minutes or so. All right. Hi. Wow. That's some interesting reading. <laughs> Thank you all for contributing all these. So there's, uh, I might just pick some of them out if you don't mind. Um, all of them are anonymous, uh, unless you want to own up to any of them. Um, so we've got words like judgy, we've got belonging, we've got dying, interesting. Uh, we've got dogma, we've got rigid, we've got religion, we've got quiche and tea. <laughs> now that is about as Christian as it gets. We've got charity, we've got bring and share, uh, where you might find the quiche. Uh, we've got a cross, not, we've got, yeah, we've got a school, we've got a um, party venue, we've got smiley faces, balloons, we've got old fashioned with a picture of an old drooling man. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got cringe, who's cringe today? Uh, we've got God's family, we've got meetings, we've got community. We've got hymns, we've got asking lots of questions, we've got ecclesia, someone's been doing the homework. <laughs> uh, we've got, uh, what else haven't I mentioned here? Tea and biscuits. Let's hear it for the tea and biscuits. Okay, uh, ce uh, celebration of creativity, music, fake people. Oh, there's a cringe. Go, see? Yeah, so there's loads of stuff. Uh, feel free at any point in the morning to come and have a look at some of the, some of the things that's up there. Uh, I think I can see both positive things and negative things, right? But where do these ideas of church actually come from? Uh, there are many examples here that we've come up with. Um, but is that what Jesus or God had in mind, if they had anything in mind? How can we know? Well, we've got the scriptures. And so we can look for clues to see what was written at the time. So some of you might remember the things um, that we're about to cover. It's all been said before over the years, but I think it'd be good to process some of these things again together as we move forward with Q. So we've heard it said many times before that Jesus himself wasn't actually a Christian and he didn't attend church. And one passage in the Bible that's popular on this is uh, Matthew 16, verse 16. And it has Jesus saying, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, we haven't got time to unpack all of the context of that. And there's a lot about rocks and the idea of gates and the gates of Hades. And if you want more info on that, there'll be links in the blog uh, to things that will help explain some of those ideas. Uh, but the key part that we want to focus on here today, obviously, is the word church. So guess what? The word church is a made-up word. I mean, mind you, 
I suppose most words are made up, aren't they? Uh, but whenever you see the word church written in your Bible, they weren't talking about what we understand church to be. Any of this. I don't think they were thinking of quiche uh, in those days. Um, but they were talking about... Um, sorry, blah, 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 I've lost my train of thought. Quiche has thrown me. <laughs> Wherever you see church written in the Bible, they weren't talking about what we understand church to be. It came about in the 1500s at a time that's actually closer to us right now in this day and age than it was to the time of Jesus. So the word church appeared in the first English translations of the Bible, and it means a religious meeting place. This was the understanding of what the church had become by the 1500s, but not necessarily what it was meant to be. It then gets applied to the scriptures to a word that does not re mean religious meeting place at all. Jesus didn't say, on this rock, I will build my religious meeting place. The original writer of the scripture has Jesus saying the Greek word, ekklesia, thanks to who wrote it. <laughs> now, ekklesia had absolutely no religious connotation at all. An ecclesia was a group of people called together for a purpose to make decisions about a matter. The word itself actually means to call out. And so any ordinary person in the community was qualified to be called out and be a part of a, a specific ecclesia for a specific cause to bring about a cultural change in the community, city, or beyond. They were called to change their world. So why is this important? Because if Jesus had intended to build a religious meeting place, culturally, he could have actually used words for that. He could have said, on this rock, I'll build my temple or synagogue, which is what would have been at the time, just to name a couple. But he didn't. He used the word ecclesia very deliberately. So, also, just to give a quick side example of an ecclesia in action, uh, and notice that it's an ecclesia as well. It's not the ecclesia, it's an, which means it's lots of isolated little things. Um, there's a bit in chapter 19 of the book of Acts where a silversmith calls for an ecclesia of other silversmiths who are losing all their business because this, there's an emerging idea that there's just one God and that silver idols are useless and should be thrown in the bin. So they're losing their business and they gather with those who are part of Paul's ministry to discuss that specific matter. Now, interestingly, in this specific chapter, the word ecclesia gets translated to assembly, not church. Now, who remembers assembly? <laughs> Good morning, teachers. And uh, cauliflowers, Fluffy? You know, a certain generation. <laughs> Cabbage is green. So, yeah, the word ecclesia becomes assembly, not church. Now, obviously, the word assembly is much more appropriate uh, to describe a gathering of people. Uh, but also, in my opinion, it shows a certain mischief by the translators because they're looking at different instances of the word ecclesia, and sometimes they're saying, that's church, and that isn't church. It's, I thought that was interesting. So, the ecclesia is a group of ordinary people assembled for a specific purpose to create change in their lives, communities, and beyond. So, I think we'll have another discussion on that now. Uh, and similarly, if you want to write post-it notes or just write the things that come to mind, draw things, whatever, similar to what we did there, and what we'll do is fill the other side of the board now uh, and see what comes out of that. So we'll do 10 minutes on that. Just feel free to have a, a free-flowing discussion, however that goes. So we'll, we'll see you again in about 10 minutes, and I think uh, Danny's going to come up and tell us a little bit about Pioneers and Settlers after we've done that. Um, just to help you with the discussion, there's a bit here I wrote that says, uh, what, what would an ecclesia look like? Uh, where does Q specifically fit with that? Uh, and how do our ideas of church fit with the concept of the ecclesia? Sorry, I should have mentioned that before. So uh, think about the things that you've written there and also think about how those fit with what an ecclesia is, as I've just described. Thanks, carry on. 
Okay, so when I was chatting with Kev this week about this, um, we were bouncing some thoughts around. Something came to mind, uh, which I think a lot of you will be familiar with. Some of you might not, um, but it is an analogy that uh, we've used over the years for two different possibilities of what church or ecclesia, how that might be expressed. Now, last week, we looked at the um, imposter syndrome and asked the question, when was the last time that you left your comfort zone. I wonder if you've been thinking about comfort zones this week. I definitely have. <laughs> There's some things that are like, oh, am I an imposter in this situation? Or actually, am I just stepping out of my comfort zone? Um, but I'd like us to consider this morning a wider context on that question about collectively, when was the last time we left our comfort zone? Um, as a community, does that question still apply? Maybe for your family, when was the last time your family group left its comfort zone? Um, and maybe that applies to work. You get changes at work. Mick's just retired. I imagine his whole office are like, what are we going to do now? <laughs> so, so <laughs> Looking at his LinkedIn post, I doubt it. Mick put a LinkedIn post about how he was retiring, and it was just... It was a whole page full of appreciation and what are we going to do without you. Um. <laughs> okay, so there are two visions of life and two kinds of people. The first group see life as a possession to be carefully guarded, and they are called settlers. The second group see life as a wild, fantastic, explosive gift. They are called pioneers. These two types give rise to two kinds of theology, settler theology and pioneer theology. And according to this guy, Wes Seliger, in his book, Western Theology, and in Western Theology, don't think location, think like, like as in cowboy land. <laughs> so he's kind of getting that idea of the Western. It's that kind of theme. He's put this idea of pioneer and settlers in this kind of metaphor of the Western scenario. Um, and he said... Uh, settler theology is an attempt to answer all the questions, to define and housebreak some sort of supreme being, establish the status quo on golden tablets in cinemascope. So that's settler theology. Pioneer theology is an attempt to talk about what it means to receive this strange gift of life. And the Wild West is the setting for both theologies. Now, he talks about lots of different aspects of Christianity expressed through pioneer and settler. But I wanted to focus on what he said about church. And this is it. He says, in settler theology, the church is the courthouse. It's the center of town life, and the old stone structure dominates the town square. Its windows are small, and this makes things dark inside. And within the courthouse walls, records are kept. Taxes collected, trials held for bad guys. I wonder if for some of you whether that is your experience of church. The courthouse is the settler's symbol of law, order, stability, and most importantly, security. The mayor's office, the mayor in this context represents God, is on the top floor, and his eagle eye ferrets out the smallest details of town life. So that's the, meta the metaphor of settlers. But pioneer theology, in pioneer theology, the church is the covered wagon. It's a house on wheels, always on the move. The covered wagon is where the pioneers eat, sleep, fight, love, and die. It bears the marks of life and movement. It creaks, is scarred with arrows, bandaged with baling wire. The covered wagon is always where the action is, and it moves towards the future and doesn't bother to glorify its own ruts. This is important. The old wagon isn't comfortable, but the pioneers don't mind. They're more into adventure than comfort. So the question that comes out of that, are you a pioneer or are you a settler? I think we would love to think that we are pioneers, because it kind of feels a little bit more heroic. My suspicion is, knowing myself and knowing human nature, most of us 
tend to be settlers. Because settlers, um, I think we like comfort in life, don't we? We kind of prefer life to be comfortable more than getting out of our comfort zone. Because it feels nicer. And we think, actually, actually, sometimes we think the point of life is to kind of be happy. And actually, if I'm uncomfortable, that doesn't feel like happy. So I'd rather stay in my comfort zone. But when you stay in your comfort zone, you settle. And when you settle, you can't be a pioneer. You can't go somewhere new. You can't question the boundaries of your life and step out of the status quo. I love what it said about how pioneers are more into adventure than comfort. Uh, I want us to just think about Jesus for a moment as a character. Settler or pioneer? He, he, uh, the word that came to mind when I thought about Jesus was an irritant. Like, he irritated people. Not to disturb you too much, but I think in common language, we'd say, Jesus pissed people off. Like, especially religious people. In fact, I would say especially settlers. People who were settled and wanted to get comfortable in life. Jesus, he really annoyed them to the point where they ended up killing him. Um, I know in the past we've talked about this, about how we think, um, oh, Jesus, I love Jesus. I don't think we'd like Jesus if we met him in person because I think he'd probably make us uncomfortable and question some of the things that actually we like to settle into. He often said things like, well, you've heard it said this, but I'm going to tell you this. So I think the nature and the spirit of being a pioneer is about not settling, stepping out of that comfort zone. Uh, I wonder what role comfort plays in your life. Um, I also don't want to demonize comfort. I think spending your whole life uncomfortable um, actually might not be great. I think life often works in a curve. When we talked about music. You start home and then you go out. Um, and often music is telling a story of a journey of going out from home, but then coming back home. And it's a combination of um, resolution and dissonance. Um, and that's what's beautiful about music. And I think that's what's beautiful about, about life. And I think we probably need a combination of both. Um, so yeah, in pioneer theology, the wagon isn't comfortable, but the pioneers don't mind because they're more into adventure than comfort. I think sometimes we have to accept some universal truths. And I think one might be, if we want a life that is adventurous and we want to be pioneers, we have to sacrifice comfort. Uh, Probably about a month ago, uh, Claire and Jenny spoke about values. Um, and I think comfort kind of fits into the value idea. I think often we hold core values that we aspire to. And we think, yeah, I want to be a pioneer. Pioneering is one of my core values. I want to grow as a person. But what um, Claire and Jenny spoke about is how often, in reality, the core values of our life, when the rubber hits the road, get exposed we actually go back to our default values, which I think comfort is probably often one of our default values that we want to settle back into. Um, okay, so what about us? What about Q? Do we want to be a culture of comfort? Do we want to be a community of comfort? Or do we want to be a pioneering community? Because I think if we want to be a pioneering community that is on a quest, we have to actually accept the reality that that's not always going to feel comfortable. Now, I think there's a paradox in here. One of the things that came up on our table was he said what they love about our community is that people feel welcome. People feel that they can express what they want. They can feel comfortable and accepted. And I think part of the paradox of relationship, and Jenny touched um, on the Values Week about true community, is actually when you feel accepted, you know that you are loved, but also you're willing to engage in some things that might feel uncomfortable because that's actually what true growth is about. Okay, I just wanted to finish with touching on some lyrics from a song that I wrote that's called Beyond Belief. It's one I've done here before. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. Um, but uh, <laughs> I think the settler kind of church is comfortable and comforting and can be a sedative from the realities of life. You can settle into the familiarity of the rules and the familiar things that might make you feel good. But I don't believe that that's what the culture of Q is about. I think that we are here as a community to sometimes be an irritant, to sometimes be the thing that says, come on, it's time to change, it's time to shake things up, it's time to break some ice. Um, 
And this song talks about faith. And it talks about how actually we have beliefs that we settle into. But faith isn't about beliefs. Faith is about going beyond beliefs. It says this, faith is not the answers we've been taught to see. Faith is not the concrete crutch of solid certainty. Faith is so much more than we've known before because faith is beyond belief. Faith is more than sedative, comfort, or relief. Faith is more than family or bowing to the chief because what we think we know is just an aperitif because faith is beyond belief. And it finishes by saying this, what we think we know is just the beginning and we're never going to grow if we just want to fit in. There's question marks buzzing around in our brains because we've been asking the unanswerable questions again. Because there are some answers that nobody can know, but there's no no-go areas where we're not going to go. Because there's a beat in our hearts that nothing can contain. And so we're going to go beyond belief again and again and again. I believe that we are a community of faith. But I believe that that faith requires the discomfort of all of us as a community, sometimes stepping out of that comfort zone to go somewhere new. Okay, Kev, back to you. Thanks, Danny. Um, yeah, th interesting the, the things that have come up about uh, comfort and discomfort. I think if you think about that example earlier of the, the silversmiths all losing their job and coming together as an ecclesia, and um, I mean, in the, in the verse, it talks about how there was actually a riot there. So <laughs> it's, it's quite a, an interesting read. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to conclude a few thoughts from the morning, but we'll have a quick look at these ideas on ecclesia. Um, and I appreciate it was a lot harder to, to write post-it notes and actually have a discussion on this, because this is, this is the known. We, we know all this. Uh, the ecclesia stuff is actually a little bit more conceptual to us, I think. Um, so it's, it's going to be harder to talk about, but um, I should have had a little look at these while Danny was speaking. But um, So there's the idea of coming together um, for a purpose, which is what we've talked about. Questioning biblical interpretations, which we've done this morning itself by challenging what church is. Um, da -da -da. Encourage, belonging, um, church makes Georgia happy. Oh, that was a nice one to put in there. Hey. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's discussion groups, it's fresh ways of thinking. Uh, it's not fixed, but it's living. So again, that, that is kind of likened to the pioneer, the wagon that's always on the move. Um, so what I'd invite you to do after we've finished is just, you know, have a look at some of these stuff, look at where there's crossovers, um, uh, but just for the meantime, I'm just going to do a quick conclusion and then we'll um, just have a nice cup of tea and carry on. <laughs> um, so I think that the label church is kind of problematic for us today, uh, just as it was adding the word church to the scriptures in the 1500s, actually. We think of the institution, the liturgy, the church services, the beliefs, the dogma, the quiche. Uh, and rather than a group of ordinary people called out to bring change to their world. Now, what I've said this week, I'm not saying from a spirit of being against, uh, being against everything that the church is, um, but being a sp more of a spirit of being for what it could be, which is something that Anne Chapman once said uh, in a talk, and I love that attitude. Because I'm not saying that the church hasn't been a wonderful thing at times, and it's done what it's been able to do, and it's got us to where we are. I'm saying that we've perhaps outgrown that label, and maybe there was another tangible expression of what Jesus was doing. Because of the nature of this place, and what it's always been through my life, uh, there's always been a sense that when you're talking to people about it, as soon as you say church, you end up having to say, uh, church, yeah, but it's not that kind of church. It's not like that. <laughs> and so it ends up getting quite clumsy to talk about um, because what we're doing here, I mean, especially in the past year or so, has become even further removed from what people would expect of a church. But having said that, look around you in the room. We've got people from all walks of life sitting around the tables and discussing and wrestling with our faith, humanity, psychology, theology, spirituality, philosophy, anything else beginning with why, ending with why, sorry? <laughs> Lobotomy, we could do a week on that. <laughs> but Jesus went after the key limiting beliefs of the day, which were all centered around religion culturally. He set out to wake people up to new ideas of the divine and who we really are, and what we're truly capable of. 
and he was notorious for upsetting the apple cart. He was very unpredictable. He didn't try to satisfy the religious crowd, and he broke every model and mindset. Much of society now isn't centered around religion, but the same limiting beliefs and mindsets still exist, and they still need challenging so that we can free ourselves and others from the mad charades of life. I don't believe that we're fully at the finished article at Q, but I think we're on to something here that more closely reflects what Jesus was talking about when he said ecclesia. It doesn't feel like church because it isn't. I'm not suggesting that we go around saying that we're an ecclesia either. I think that would be even stranger than telling people that you go to church. So anyway, thank you for listening and engaging this morning. Thanks for all the thoughts and, and the post-its and things. Uh, and there's a lot more mileage in this subject. I think we've barely scratched the surface, really. There's a lot of other facets to, to think about. Um, but there's lots of great stuff that we brought up together. Um, and we'll need to flesh it out together in future weeks. Um, so keep these things on your mind. Uh, and get in, get in touch with us as well. As well. Uh, there's Danny, Joel, Beth, uh, Claire, myself. Um, just, just talk to us about these things because uh, we're trying to do something here uh, and keep moving forward. So thanks again and have a great week and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>